Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. We're hanging out under the night sky with our good friend, Ima Barrera. Ima, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. What about you? Doing absolutely excellent, although it's it's a little bit sunnier by me than it is by you right now. It, it, looks, it looks a little bit more nighttime in, in the back over there. Yes, it is, although I'm not in Capitol Reef, but I'm in New Jersey, so... <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So for those of you who don't know, we're talking we're talking night stuff today with Ema. So she's going to give you a ton of great information about it. If you do have any questions that you want to get answered, please make sure to ask them. That's what we're here to do to help share the knowledge, share the wealth. So if you're joining us here on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab. If you're joining us on Vimeo or Facebook, go ahead and use the comment section and we'll make sure to get them addressed by Ema towards the end of this event. But thank you so much for being here, Ema. We really appreciate it. I'm going to go jump off camera so you can go ahead and share your screen and I'll see you back in a little while. Okay, well, I, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Scott, Derek, and Courtney, uh, on everybody in the team of uh, the BNH Event Space team for giving me this opportunity to share my work. And also, I would like to thank the audience for being here either now or maybe later. It doesn't matter as long as uh, you're here. That's important. And I really hope you guys will enjoy the presentation. So, let me introduce myself. My name is Inma Barrera, and I'm the founder and owner of Inma Photography. Here I have my contact information. So if you have more questions and we don't have time to, to discuss them in the presentation or later on, if you have questions, just feel free to reach. Here is my website, my email address, and also my Instagram and Facebook handle, because you can also reach out to me through social media, email, or uh, my website. Okay. So a little bit about myself for those who don't know me. I'm actually a biologist, a scientist. I have a PhD in molecular biology. And I have spent many years of my research uh, taking images of um, molecules, cells, bacteria, viruses, under electron, optical, and fluorescent microscopes. So I use photography as a tool for my research. But I'm also a photographer and I'm an educator. So I'm not only now a, a professor at a college where I teach microbiology, but I also teach photography through my company. And I teach basic photography classes, group and private, but I also teach more advanced courses, especially night photography. And I have some uh, workshops for this year. The Aesthetic one has, is sold out already. I still have two positions or two open slots for Acadia in June. And also we will run a long exposure for color um, workshop in Acadia in September. Also do local workshops in the New York, New Jersey area, again, groups, private, long exposures, moon alignments, night photography. Okay, so I also have published some books and I would like to just talk about them a little bit because they're part of the project that uh, I will be discussing later. So. The first book is The Stars, the Moon, and the Sun. This is the book, so you can see the size. And this book actually is the result of me joining the BNH Portfolio Development Program. BNH ran this program a while ago, before COVID. And the purpose of the program was to invite some photographers to develop a project. Uh, taking images for the project and having critique with the ultimate goal of publishing a book. So as you can see, I have been successful. I published my book and I thank b &H for this opportunity because it was my first time that I was really getting more, not serious because I was serious with my company, but as far as career development, that was a great opportunity. And then I have been selected as an artist in residence for several national parks since the book, the book actually helped me launch that, that bigger project. And I have been an artist in residence for Capitol Reef, Acadia, Glacier, and next month, I'm gonna go to the Grand Canyon also as an artist in residence. So for, for these four parks, I'm actually going to publish a series, Photographic Journeys Through the National Parks. And the one that's available right now is the one on Capitol Reef, which is this book here. And the one about Glacier is now uh, on proofreading stages. Then I will have Acadia, the Grand Canyon. So this is basically the books that I have published that are part of my goals for the residencies that I'm applying at. 
that's what I wanted to discuss them. There's a main book, which is going to be all the astrophotography from all the parks, and that's called Under the Night Sky. That's the big project. But from each national park, I have enough material that I can publish separate books each for each park. Okay, so the agenda for today is we're going to talk about the Under the Night Sky project because that's basically how all these residencies happen. Uh, I submitted my applications with this project in mind. And the goal, the main goal of this project is to raise awareness about light pollution with the general public by giving presentations like this one, discussing uh, uh, light pollution and what we can do about light pollution and also capturing the night skies in those parks. Okay, so we'll talk about light pollution, we'll talk about the Milky Way, we get a little bit technical about how to shoot uh, the Milky Way or astrophotography. Uh, it's not going to be an in-depth technical presentation, but at least if you never have taken any pictures at night, it will give you an idea to where to get started, and then you just can go ahead by Googling or watching YouTube videos or taking workshops or learning. Uh, but it will give you uh, an introduction so that you know, okay, this is something I can do. I can take pictures like that and then um, get it started. And then, then the rest of the talk is going to be the night photography uh, pictures that I have taken as an artist in residence so that they can give you some inspiration or places to you can go and take a, a pictures of at night. And if I have time, I'll include um, another national park that was actually the first one where my project was conceived. Okay, as I said, Under the Night Sky is the name of my project. And basically, when you submit uh, an application to be an artist in residence, they ask you to have a project. Why do you want to be an artist in the park? So that's basically the same project I applied to for all these uh, residences because each of them is going to be a chapter of this book under the night sky with the general goal to raise awareness about light pollution. So what is light pollution? Light pollution is wasted light that performs no function or task. It's the light that we actually do not need, that doesn't help us, doesn't help us feel safe, doesn't help us see when we walk down the street, it's just light that goes into the sky and it serves no purpose. Examples could be sky glow, glare, lights from um, coming out from lamps or things like that. If we look at the map of the world, we'll see that the areas where there's more population, like half of the US and California, some areas of Canada, areas around uh, the city of Mexico, Europe, Japan, areas around like New Delhi or other big cities, those are very light polluted. This map is light pollution in the planet. So the more population an area has, the more likelihood the people living there do not see the stars at night. So they don't have access to the dark sky. And this has an effect in, a, in ourselves, in our uh, well-being, because we need to have a good night rest. But it also affects the environment, affects the ecosystems and the animals that live in those ecosystems, either nocturnal animals, plants, but even at, during the animals that are active during the day are going to get affected if the animals that are active at night don't have, a, they are not really uh, being in a healthy environment. They might be able, no, they might not be able to eat certain uh, animals that need to be, the population needs to be controlled. Things like that affect the very uh, delicate balance of, of any ecosystem. Okay, that was my biology. I had to say something about it. So the good news about light pollution is that actually is one of the very few types of pollution where we can actually do something about it and reverse it as much as we can. Because it's just basically turning on and off the lights at the right time. Or if we have the lights on at night, having shields that direct the light down. So because that's where we need the light. We need the light pointing down so we can see, we can feel safe. We don't need to have three, the light going 360 degrees all over the place. We can also use energy efficient and warm white light bulbs because they can be uh, more natural to, uh, to wildlife, so they don't feel as disruptive for them. We can also use timers 
so that when we are all home and we're all resting in bed, we don't have to have the lights outside on. So things like that are minor, but it actually has an impact, especially in areas like where we live, New York, New Jersey, or Connecticut, or Pennsylvania, where there are so uh, populated that we barely can see the sky at night. So there are areas like, for instance, Chittenango, that's a small town in upstate New York near Syracuse, they change all the lighting system or the streets and the lights all point down. And there you can see the skies, uh, the dark sky and the stars, because even if you are so close to Syracuse, the light fixtures help control where the light is going. So if people are interested in knowing what we can do, they can always uh, lobby their mayors or their governors or whoever they know to get things get going because we in the East Coast, we don't have very good skies. But you can learn more about it if you join the International Dark Sky Association. This association is a non-for-profit organization actually is involved with the different national parks or, uh, all over the world, and they uh, grade them based on the quality of their dark skies. So many skies, uh, national parks in the US work very closely with IVA to ensure that the, because it's part of the mission of the national parks, to ensure that the dark skies are preserved. So I wanted to show you this picture uh, because this is a 2020 uh, calendar. And that year, um, IVA ran, ran a campaign to raise money. They call it the One Big Sky Campaign. So they donate, people will donate money and they will send, depending on the amount, this calendar for 2020. And I chose it to show it to you because this picture, they got, they asked photographers to donate pictures for the calendar and they got pictures from all over the world, out west, in Australia, Africa, you name it. Anywhere there's a national photographer, they send their pictures. But they chose this picture, which I took, uh, but they chose this picture for the cover and these are the Catskills in New York. So for me, that's not just happy, uh, not I'm just happy that they chose my picture. I was proud that they chose the Catskills because despite the fact that the East Coast is very light polluted, it gives a message of hope. If we control light pollution, we still have hope. We still can see dark skies, this area in New York State or the shore in New Jersey where you can still see the Milky Way. It's not as dark and as beautiful as you will see out West, but we still can see the Milky Way and that's why I published that book. Um, but as I said, this is, for me, was a, a reason to be proud because of the Catskills being in New York State. Okay, so this is my uh, part, my portion about light pollution. And now we're gonna get more uh, into the stuff that I'm sure that a photographer wants to know about, which is the Milky Way. Let's learn a little bit about the Milky Way. The most photographed part of the Milky Way is the galactic core. Okay, it's found arching from south to north, the, the Milky Way, between the constellations of Sagittarius on the left and the Scorpius on the right. That's where the galactic core is. So when you are out there at night, just go and face southeast, depending southeast, south, southwest, depending on the time of the year, but you face that direction. And if you're able to see Sagittarius and Scorpius, you'll see the galactic core in between. And I'll show you pictures so that you actually can see uh, how they look like. Scorpius and Sagittarius. The easiest way to identify a Scorpius is through a star called Antares, which is the brightest star and is the closest to the core. So when you find Antares, you're gonna know an hour later, that's where the core is gonna be. And there's also the summer triangle that in the, the Milky Way, the, the arch of the Milky Way goes through the summer triangle in the summer. And the triangle consists of Altair, Deneb, and Vega stars. And then towards the north, we will find Cassiopeia. So that we, you identify Cassiopeia has like a W kind of shape that will be towards the north and that's the north arm of the Milky Way. So this is a picture of the arch, so you can see. And here on the right part of the picture, I don't know if you guys can see it, I'm pointing it here. 
Uh, this star here, that's Antares. It's very basically on the right part of the image in the middle. Yeah, here, that's Antares. Antares is part of Scorpius and is part also of Rho Fuki. That's this group of cluster of stars here. This is the brightest part of the Milky Way, the galactic core, again, on the right. And you can see a nebula, the Dark Horse Nebula. It's kind of vertical, but if you go uh, move your head towards your shoulder, you will be able to see has the shape of a horse. The top of the shape is the head, then comes the, the legs, and the upper legs are pointing towards Antares. Then on the other side of the Dark Horse Nebula, you have the brightest, that's the core. And on top of the core uh, is a con um, nebula called the Lagoon Nebula or M8. And to the left of M8, that's where we will have Sagittarius. This particular year, we had Saturn very close to the core. And there's other nebulas like M24, and if you continue looking at the arch, on the top part of the arch, towards the top of the picture in the middle, you'll see uh, the Great Reef, which is this darker band that kind of splits the Milky Way in two. And then we can see the Summer Triangle, Vega to the top left, the Neb underneath. And if we move towards the middle, uh, top middle of the picture, we'll see Altair. Alter, Vega, and the Nef, those are the summer uh, triangle. That's where the Milky Way is found in the summer months. I'm not gonna go into the details of this picture, but I just have it here because people can always pause when they need to, and they can look at these different nebulas and constellations. Some of these, those that are in yellow, are those that are usually uh, preferred for people who like to shoot deep space photography like the Eagle Nebula or Pillars of Creation at the very top. That's a very popular subject for deep space. Also Rof, Yuki and Antares that will be towards the bottom left. Antares is the yellow, bright yellow star. And it's actually the easiest way. It's a very easy. You face Southeast, you'll see Antares, you'll know where the Milky Way is gonna be in an hour. So Antares is basically how I look for the Milky Way. Uh, sometimes when you're at a national park, you may have apps like Photo Pills or Planet or other apps but when you're out there in a national park, there's no cell phone reception. So you need to, I need to learn how to find the Milky Way just by looking at the stars. So Antares is basically what I use to identify where the Milky Way is going to be. And then we have to the left side of Antares, we have the Dark Horse Nebula and other nebulas that I just mentioned, like the Lagoon Nebula or the Sagittarius Star Cloud, the M21, 22, 25. As I said, this is just for people if they need to take a, an idea because it helps and knows, as I said, these are some uh, targets for deep space astrophotography. So what are we going to be capturing the Milky Way? Um, as I said, you can actually capture it here uh, in the Jersey Shore. You can capture it towards the summer. You can go to the Catskills, like I showed you a picture, or also the Adirondacks, all those areas are good for the Milky Way. Long Island is also good, especially Montauk. I know it's a bit of a drive, but Montauk is actually a pretty dark area as well. So those are areas within our local um, states where you can actually go to uh, take uh, pictures of the Milky Way. I borrowed this picture from a friend, Royce Baer, and he has here a picture of Capitol Reef. And Capitol Reef is classified as Mortal Class One sky. Scientists put together a classification of based on the quality of the skies, how dark they are. So class one is as dark as it can be. So Capitol Reef is actually my, one of my favorite places because it is really, really dark. And then as you lose contrast because of light pollution, it can go all the way till nine, that scale. So nine would be, for instance, like New York City, Philadelphia, Chicago, LA, Cities will be very uh, light polluted, as you can imagine, and you barely can see the sky, the stars at night. So in between, we have from one to nine, several uh, zones. New Jersey Shore, Montauk, and all those areas like Caskets, it will be a class four. So you can see compared to one in this picture, class four is still dim, is not as contrasting, but it still is visible. Even with the naked eye, if you really know what you're looking at and you've been You've been doing it for so long that you can see it right away. But if it's your first or your 
third time, you might still not be able to see it completely. But the cameras, the sensors do. That's what matters at the end of the day. And then at class five, it's kind of like, you know, not ideal. Forget about six, seven, eight, and nine. You cannot, uh, not even the sensor can help you there. Okay. So when we, now we know what it is, where to find it, where, uh, where, which areas would be good. So now is when do we capture the Milky Way? So the best, the Milky Way galactic core is above the horizon, starting for some minutes in February, all the way to November. Uh, the, the Milky Way is always visible, always, because we are, a, a solar system is in the Milky Way. So we always will see the Milky Way. The galactic core, the brightest part, is only visible between February and November. February, a few minutes, November, a few minutes. And as the time goes by, we have bigger windows to be able to photograph the Milky Way. So March and April is some hours before sunrise. May and June, it starts being just closer to uh, the, uh, when it gets dark after uh, twilight or after dawn. And then June, July, we will have the Milky Way very high in the sky. That's why we have that summer triangle. It's very vertical, the Milky Way, the arch. Then September and October, we're having, uh, starting to have less and less time to see the Milky Way. And then in November, it's again just a few minutes, maybe like half an hour or so that we can take pictures of the Milky Way. And that's basically what I would say. The best time of the year is between May and June because it's not so high in the horizon. So you still can photograph the arch, but still you have plenty of time and it's closer to twilight. At so you don't have to be up like at 3 a.m. to go somewhere and take a picture from 4 a.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, in uh, uh, May, June, you can start taking pictures around 11 p.m. and makes life a lot easier, uh, especially if you like to sleep. Okay, so let's get now a little bit technical and about uh, gear. So what camera do I use? And again, I, I'm sh I should Nikon, but it, Canon and Sony or any other camera is good. The, uh, Pentax is just because I that's the ones I know, Nikon. I have the Z72, the D750, and the D500. The D750 for a DSLR is excellent. It's excellent. Uh, I actually prefer it to the D850, but uh, because the sensor really can handle noise very well. And that's what's important. You want a camera that can handle the noise. So nowadays, the newer the camera, the better the sensor is the easier it's going to be for that camera to handle noise so that the images are cleaner. Um, again, Sony has excellent cameras, so Canon, and some of them have even astro-modified cameras. But to get started, I mean, I have a crop sensor here. I have the D500. I got started with the D5500, which is actually an entry-level Nikon, but the sensor was good. So that's what matters, that if you have even an entry-level, but it's not a very old model, you can capture the Milky Way pretty good uh, because the sensors will handle 6400 ISO. Lens, ideally, you want lens with big aperture, like 2.8, uh, around that. If you go 1.4, it's even better, but 2.8 is good. Most people will have lenses like the Tokina for the crop sensor bodies or the Sigma. That's the one I use for my full frame, the Sigma 1424 Art 2.8. And also I have used some of the primes, especially the 35 millimeter prime. The 50, I, I use, a, I have shot with the 50, but I prefer to use a tracker for the 50. But anyway, you have a camera that is not too old. You have a, a, a lens that can go 2.8. You can also shoot at 3.5. Again, it's not gonna be as ideal, but is doable, which is what it matters. At the end of the day, if you want to try, if you have a 3.5, try with a 3.5. And if you love astrophotography, then you know you can go and upgrade your lens. But there's no reason why a crop sensor, a 3.5 lens in a camera that can handle noise, that you cannot shoot astro. You actually should try and see what you get. And when you need a tripod, tripod is a must because you will be shooting for 15, 20 seconds, you have to have a tripod. And as I said, this is the good gear, but there's no reason why you couldn't try with your regular gear. 
Okay, so now you decided you shot with your uh, lenses, you really like astrophotography and you're thinking, okay, now that I can capture the Milky Way, I want to do much better. What can I do next? So what's the nice to have here? Star Tracker. I'm an ambassador for Good Shoot Move Tracker and I love that tracker because it's very portable, it's very easy to set up. And when you are out there and it's cold and you only have half an hour to shoot, you don't want to mess up with your gear. You just want something that is easy, portable, and you can set it up quickly and start getting, start shooting. Intervalometer, if you have one, it's good. Or otherwise you can use a self timer. If you want to illuminate your foreground, you can also use LED lights in a process we call low level lighting. If where you are shooting allows you to use lights because some national parks, Zion is notorious for that. Sorry, Arches. Arches doesn't allow any light at all because of delicate arch. There were way too many photographers shooting delicate arch and they got very strict, no lights. But I use the Loom Cube mini panel uh, and I also use the, the cube itself to illuminate the foreground. That's if I'm somewhere out west where basically it's dark. If I'm in New Jersey, I don't need anything because light pollution is there. So I get uh, courtesy of light pollution, I get my foregrounds already with enough uh, definition. And then you add apps and software that help you find the Milky Way like Planet Pro or Photopills or similar software. And also some software that will help you post-process uh, your Milky Way shots. Okay, so settings, I know people like to ask about settings. I actually, settings give you a starting point, but don't get um, thinking, oh, these are the settings I have to try all the time. No, because your settings are gonna depend on light pollution. That's why it's important. If you have a lot of light pollution, you're gonna have to use less ISO, otherwise your shot is gonna look too bright for a night shot. So play with your settings. You can start with, um, for instance, aperture 2.8. You can have 3.5 if you if you don't have a 2.8 lens. You can also go as I said 1.8, uh, something around that. The bigger the aperture, the more light you can capture, the better. Uh, the shutter speed depends on your focal length, and you can Google this. Uh, the 400 rule, the 500 rule, or the MPF rule, that basically are the formulas people do to calculate how the maximum shutter speed you can have for your picture. And as an example, you have 500 divided by 50, 10 seconds. That's as long as you can have your shutter open. So just Google this term so that I can help you um, learn about more uh, how open um, you can have your uh, camera. Just shatter. Again, the ISO depends on the light pollution. I have shot at ISO 3200 if it's light polluted. I have gone to places that are dark, like those national parks, and I shoot at 8000 there because at 3200, my image is, just, is too dark. So that's basically uh, what I adjust based on where I am. And it's also very important always to shoot uh, manual mode and manual focus. Uh, you, if you leave your uh, focus in automatic, your camera might be hunting for focus at night. So just switch everything to manual and focus on the stars. Okay, now a little bit of a break as far as um, Milky Way. I would like now to discuss uh, Star Trek photography because I have some images, so I want to explain how they are taken. So the Star Trek photography is basically when you capture the movement of the stars through a period of time usually minutes or even hours. So instead of having pinpoint sharp stars, you're gonna have like a trail. That's basically the distance that star travel while you have, you were taking those pictures, okay? So how do we uh, do a star trails? More people like to find the North Star or Polaris because then you get those nice concentric circles. And how do we find the star trail? If we look at the Big Dipper, this is the shape of the Big Dipper, like a spoon. But there's two stars at the side of the spoon. I don't know if I pronounced them right, Dabi and Merak. They're called the pointers, because if you measure the distance between both Merak and Dabi, and then you count that distance five times in the direction those stars are pointing, 
you'll find Polaris. So that's basically the easiest way to find Polaris. Polaris is the North Star. So it's at the North, close to the North Pole, but it's not the brightest star. It's actually not that bright. And the Little Dipper itself is actually not as easy to find as the Big Dipper. But once you have found the Big Dipper and Polaris, then you'll be able to see the Little Dipper. So now when you have found Polaris, you can uh, take your picture, point at Polaris, and then you can get your uh, circles. And these are the different patterns because you don't always have to shoot facing north. But here we can see if you face north, you will have in the middle the North Star. Not really exactly in the middle, but close enough. And those uh, circles. And depending if you're facing northeast, east, southeast, you can see how those patterns are changing. If we are in the northern hemisphere and we're pointing south, we actually get also those concentric circles, except that the center of those circles will be actually the southern cross. But we are in the North Star, we don't see the Southern Cross, so that's why we don't get the circles. But the shapes of the, tra of the trails are going to be circles, as opposed to be more like uh, arrows here or more vertical, uh, at an angle, but vertical uh, patterns that we get, depending on which orientation we're getting. So you can experiment. You don't always have to be shooting north with the star trails. Some of these shots are beautiful, regardless of which direction you're, go you're facing. OK, so this is all about the technical aspects. Now we, I'm going to focus the rest of my presentation, the next 20 minutes or so, about the pictures I have taken as an artist in residence. And hopefully that can give you some inspiration. You can learn about these parks. And if you have a chance to visit them, then you have some ideas for what to shoot over there. So my project, again, under the night sky, started at Joshua Tree. That's basically where I had the idea that I wanted to have a big project that would take several years to complete my project, but I wanted to apply to those residences because I wanted to have a uh, documentation of the different parks, how different parks handle uh, or protect their night skies. And also because I uh, wanted to, again, raise awareness about light pollution. So after Joshua Tree, I started applying, wrote my proposal, I started applying to the national parks. The first one I got of my residences was Capitol Reef. Capitol Reef is unique in the sense that they have a specific uh, uh, residency for a night photography because it's actually one of the darkest skies I personally have seen. There might be others as well, but I have not been anywhere as dark in the US as Capitol Reef. And this is some of the pictures I took of the Milky Way. It was spectacular. I just cannot say that going to these places is really like a dream come true because the dark, the skies are so dark. The Milky Way is so easy to see. It's almost like hits you like, wow, that, that's the Milky Way. Or when I saw the Big Dipper the first time I got out of my uh, uh, housing, because they give you housing in some cases, I got out of the house and then I saw, boom, the Big Dipper. It's like, instead of me, okay, let me see, where would the Big Dipper be? Why am I facing north? No, it was there. It's like, uh, yeah, you, you could see it so easily. And this basically, this picture was taken at the Fruta Valley, which is basically the area where the Mormon settlers uh, started um, de developing their communities within the Capitol Reef area. And here we see the Mormon schoolhouse. And here to the right of the picture, that's Utah Highway 24 that basically crosses uh, Capitol Reef National Park. So this was taken my very first night. I landed, I got there, I actually got uh, retrieved the key to the housing, le left all my suitcases in, went out to start shooting because there was no clouds. It's like, I'm not gonna waste a night. I'm just gonna go out and shoot, I'll sleep during the day. The next day I went to Cathedral Valley. And if you ever go to Capitol Reef, do not skip Cathedral Valley. Yes, you need a four by four, a high clearance vehicle or something like that, a four wheel drive, but it's really, really worth it. And this is the Temple of the Sun. And you can see how, uh, this is actually pretty uh, tall monolith. It's about 5,000 feet or 5,800 feet, sorry. And, you can see now here, this was 2019. To the left, we have the galactic core. And now you can see almost on the top of the tip of the Temple of the Sun, we have Antares and this kind of 
circle here, that is Rolf Yuki. You can see this bright dot riding the, the horse nebula. This is Jupiter. And you can see here the Milky Way. This kind of like a yeah, lagoon nebula. So you can see the another nebula here in the between those two parts of the Milky Way. And this is the Temple of the Sun. That's the Temple of the Moon. Previous was the Temple of the Sun. So this is the Temple of the Moon. This is about 1,500 feet. You can see now that the uh, row of Yuki is a little bit to the left part of the temple. And the one in the middle, that would be Antares. Again, Jupiter was extremely bright. 2019 because it was just riding in the Dark Horse Nebula. Right now, Jupiter is not anywhere near the galactic core. And you have, again, all the nebulas here. I just want to point something about the post-processing of these pictures. You can see this one, the Temple of the Sun. The foreground is a little bit flatter just because I had to use the light coming from the stars. When I was there, I could still use level light, but nowadays the reef has also uh, forbidden the use of light for night photography. So, but it's flat because most it was lit by the stars, and that gives a flat look to the foreground. Whereas this one, you can already, there are some shadows to the left, sorry, to the right of the uh, area. And that's because when I set up the camera to shoot, this uh, composition, I had it shooting for a start, and therefore my foreground, which I ended, the sky is blended with my foreground so I can recover the detail. But that blend is what we call a blue hour blend. That's why the shadows, because it's closer to when the sun is going to run, there is a little bit more uh, dynamic look to the foreground. So as I said, I set up the camera to shoot a star trace, but I knew also that my settings were the same for the Milky Way. So I was shooting Milky Way and the star trace at the same time. And these are the star trails. So that's what I talked about the star trails before, because I wanted to show you this picture. You can see the difference. Uh, you can see, for instance, this bright dot, which I said before is Jupiter. This was about an hour, an hour and a half that I had the camera going on for the star trail. And you can see the distance, Jupiter from the area where the dark nebula is moving all the way to touch the temple of the moon. So that's the distance all the stars traveled in that hour and, an hour and a half that I had the camera open. Uh, so, but you can see also that the pattern, even if it's not those concentric circles, I still like the pattern that we get when we face southeast. It's not necessarily completely south, it's a little bit southeast. That's why the circles are not really perfect. This is another Milky Way shot from um, Capitol Reef. And this is Chimney Rock, which you basically will see if you drive on Utah Highway 24. This is a very popular spot for night photography because it has this very big, beautiful rock formation and the scenery that's typical of Capitol Reef uh, with some of the trees and bushes, but also because cars drive by, it's kind of nice that you can, that sometimes those uh, lights from the cars give you also that uh, light on the foreground. So it helps you create that sense of shadow, which gives you a better sense of the three dimension formations. This is actually another blue hour blend, not really blue hour, but pretty close to blue hour. This is spectral pyramid. And again, here you see that there's like a little bridge that will be Utah Highway 24. So you can see all these pictures except for Capitol Reef, uh, Cathedral Valley, but the schoolhouse, chimney rock, spectral pyramid, all these are just off uh, Highway 24. Uh, but you can see here, the details in the mountains and the bushes, again, because this foreground was captured closer to the blue hour and then blended to the sky that I shot before when it was still dark. This is now part of the Fruta area. 
where the campground is. So to the right of this picture, that's where the campground is. And this is the barn and there are horses and people can just go horse riding. And behind me, actually, there is a very nice shop where they have pies and jam. And all this is basically areas where the Mormons used to live. They planted all these orchards. That's why it's called the Fruta Valley District. So this is basically one of the main places where people stop by, visit in the park. And again, facing Southeast, Jupiter that night was incredibly bright. I actually had to tone it down because it was just like overblown. To the upper part of the left side, we have Antares and Rofuyuki. And here on top of this mountain, that's the Kohav Canyon. And here you can go inside the canyon while you go hiking. This is Saturn. And this is a panorama shot. And people sometimes wonder, can you shoot the Milky Way if the moon is out? Okay, the answer is, if you're in New Jersey, you cannot. But if you are somewhere that is dark, yes, you can. And that's an example. These are single shots stitched together as a panel, but each of these is a single shot. I'm not blending my foreground here. This is a set, single shots stitched together. And my foreground is lit because the moon is still out. So you actually can see that the Milky Way is faint. It's not as bright as you have seen in the previous pictures, but you still can see, you can still can capture it. And you can see the arch now. It's a May arch, because I was in Capital River Merge, arching. So this is Southeast all the way that direction, which will be North. So the left part of the picture is North, the right part of the picture is Southeast. And these are star trails. This is very close to the place where I took the pano. This is cathedral, uh, ca the castle. This is the castle formation, which this is the Fremont River. And this is very, very close to the visitor center. Here in the middle, that's the north. The, and then around the north, the, all the stars are rotating. And that's why we get these concentric circles that we talked in before. This is another different way of post-processing. This is more the traditional, uh, traditional style of post-processing star trails. And this is more where I was playing with the post-processing tools in Photoshop. So if you have a preference for one or the other, feel free to comment because I, I can't decide. I like them both. This is, as I said, more traditional, more what you're used to seeing. But here the circles look more, I don't know, uh, mystic. So different looks. So that's for Capitol Reef. So 2019, then comes 2020, and I got selected to go to Acadia. Then COVID happened, and it was postponed for a year. So I went to Acadia in 2021. Um, so I when I was looking at the different parks for my project, I was looking at different parks with very different ecosystems. Don't forget, I'm a biologist, and I want to capture those ecosystems as well, not just the dark sky. Because the sky, if it's dark, it's going to be dark everywhere. What makes the picture is the different uh, scenery you're photographing. So this is Arcadia, and this is actually in the Scudic Peninsula. And you can see here the Milky Way. You see now there's nothing uh, near the Dark Horse Nebula. Jupiter has moved out of the way. But you still can see to the top left part of the picture, Antares, that yellow dot, Rofiuki, Scorpio, which has a shape like an inverted L, kind of. And some of the stars here to the right of the core, sorry, the left, <laughs> the left of the core. I need to learn my, my hands. So to the left of the core, we will have Sagittarius. And then here in the center, the galactic core. And we can see here that pinkish dot, that's going to be the Lagoon Nebula. So obviously in Acadia being um, by the sea, there's going to be a lot of uh, sea images here. This spot is kind of nice because not too far from it, we actually get to see bioluminescence, which is kind of cool. So these are bacteria or some protozoa that are basically able to meet bioluminescence. And at night, if the sea is rough and the right conditions are there and you have a good camera, you actually can capture the bioluminescence. So you can see here your typical evergreen trees from Acadia, your ragged shore uh, line. And in this particular area, as I said, where the sea is rough and it hits the rocks, you get to see bioluminescence. Those protozoa and bacteria 
because of the movement of the water hitting the rock, kind of get a little bit scared, so to speak, and they start emitting this uh, bioluminescence light so they can communicate with each other. That's the biology behind this shot. This is uh, one of my favorite pictures of Acadia. Some areas at Acadia at, uh, where it's low tide, you can actually walk from the peninsula to the island. But when the tide goes high, they, they become an island. So they're no longer. So if you go hiking in a place like that, you need to be taking care of when the tide is high, otherwise you're gonna spend the night there. So, but this is perfect because even if the tide is high, it's never gonna be, the sea is never going to be that high that it's going to be difficult to, to actually get a reflection. This is actually a very calm area. It took me three nights to get this shot because I needed to have high tide. I needed to have no clouds, and I had clouds all the time, and I needed to have no wind at all. So finally, after three nights attempting this shot, I finally got it. So finally, I had like a half an hour or maybe 20 minutes time to be able to have the right conditions. And I got it. As I say, it took me three nights out of the 15 nights I was there, but I got it. This is also one of my favorite shots. I have to say I love them. <laughs> I guess because I was there for hours, I have to like them. <laughs> but this is Eagle Lake. Now you can see the Milky Way again, the galactic core here towards the middle, a little bit to the right. You have Antares, Rofiuki, Scorpio, you have some of the mountains in the back of Eagle Lake and some of the trees by the shore, and then you have the reflection. So this shot, this shot is basically a blend of three. When I'm talking about blend, yes, it's technically a composite, except that I am there, I'm not moving my camera, I'm just changing the exposure so I can expose for everything because I cannot expose for the sky and get details in the foreground. My foreground, this foreground actually is about 30 or 40 minutes. So were the foregrounds at Capitol Reef, 40 minutes exposures, because there's no dark, there's no light, it's dark. And I need to have the stars to illuminate my foreground. And you can imagine that's not very bright. Therefore, it takes me 40 minutes to capture those details. And then I had also to blend the foreground with the, with the reflection. So basically that's most of my shots, either my skies uh, stacked or tracked, and then exposure for the foreground with low level light, if I can do it, depends on the regulations of the place where I am. Otherwise I use the starlight or I blend blue hour shots with my stars. This is Thunder Hole a very popular location within Acadia because when it gets very rough, very windy during the storms, there's this huge standard of water that's spraying all over. So that's this spot. And again, you can see Antares here is very, very bright and yellow. Another location in one of the overlooks, walking on that uh, loop, the one uh, way loop that is in the park. So when you drive there, there's several areas you can stop and take pictures. This is one of those. Little Hunter's Beach, when I went down to the beach, this was taken in July. So you can see how vertical the Milky Way is because in July and August, the Milky Way is almost vertical. This again, Little Hunter's Beach, earlier. This shot was earlier than the other one. So that's why the Milky Way is still not completely vertical, but as the night progresses, it gets to be vertical. And then you can see here that the Dark Horse Nebula is just really behind those trees. And these are some star trails. Again, I'm facing north. You can see now I was playing with my post-processing and you can see the different colors of the different stars facing north. This is Jordan Pond. This is a very uh, popular location for star trails because you have the bubbles, those uh, two mountains in the very back of Jordan Pond, and you have the star trail almost the, the North Star almost aligning perfectly with those bubbles. So that's for Acadia. And now my last residency for 2021 is going to be Glacier National Park. Okay, so this is basically Hanging Valley. You have here some of the characteristic mountains of Glacier that this is Mount Oberlin, Mount Clemens, Mount Cannon. 
This is a glacier here, and this is a waterfall that drops like about 500 feet and the Milky Way. This is also a popular spot. This is Jackson Glacier, and it's one of the few glaciers you can see from the road. Shooting the Milky Way at the gla at glacier, one needs to be careful because there's grizzly bears. So you either go with a group of people or you stay close to the, um, to the roads. In my case, being an artist in residence, I was trained to handle grizzlies. I was also given a radio, a bear spray, and in some cases, a uh, park ranger came with me to shoot with me. So I was safe, I felt safe at the time. That's another beautiful thing about being an artist in residence. You actually get to see how the parks operate and you get to make friends within the rangers and they treat you so well. It's just a fantastic experience. Again, this is Jackson Glacier. This is St. Mary Visitor Center. So this is basically at the end of the east entrance of the park. St. Mary is the name of the little town. So when you enter the park, this is the visitor center. And this is where the night sky festival takes place here and Akbar village. But here they have actually a telescope that is hooked to a computer and a screen. So that's basically where you would like to be if you wanna participate in the night sky festival. This is Logan Pass and this is my, these are also some of my favorite pictures. Uh, I was shooting with people here. So I was able to feel a little bit more adventurous and walk. Uh, without worrying about grizzlies. So this is Mount Reynolds. And this is the same, a little bit different spot, but the same uh, mountains, Mount Reynolds. You can see the difference in the composition here. The Milky Way is still a little bit uh, with an angle. This is July. But then as the night progresses, the Milky Way starts getting more and more vertical. And you can see here, um, kind of like erupting. I like it because it's like a, it's not a volcano, obviously but it looks like a volcano that's erupting all these stars. So that's why I like this shot. So we went hiking with the rangers and so we were safe. And uh, this is the overlook at Hidden Lake. This is Hidden Lake, Bear Hat Mountain. And we can see here the Milky Way. You can see very close to the mountain. You can see Antares and you can see also on top of the, the uh, brightest part, the core, you can see the Lagoon Nebula. And you can see some of the stars to the left of the core of Sagittarius. I like this picture because that reminds me of The Shining for those who like uh, Stanley Kubrick. It's one of my favorite directors. So if you see The Shining, this is one of the very first images you see of the movie. So this is this little island is Wild Goose Island. And this is St. Mary's Lake. Don't ask me about the name of the mountains. <laughs> These are just way too many mountains. And here I lost track of the mountains. This is McDonald Creek as it goes into McDonald Lake. And there is some light pollution here against the mountains. And this is where the McDonald Lodge is. And actually not far from that lodge is where my cabin, because they gave me a, a cabin for me to stay. That's where I was actually staying at the park. And they towards the very end, uh, the right side, that's light pollution coming from Akbar and West Glacier towns. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the presentation for those three national parks. As I said, in um, next month, I'll be going to the Grand Canyon, which will be another chapter of my book. So I finish on time. I'm happy. Excellent. Yes, you did. You did a wonderful job of finishing on time, Ima. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful information. Great, beautiful visual images. Uh, we'll jump into some questions here and get them answered for everybody now. First question is coming from Chelsea off of Facebook. Thanks for joining us here. Uh, wants to know, do you personally recommend motion sensors for lights so that they only go on at night and when there's some someone moving? Yes, that's actually a great idea, yes. Because, yes, if you're moving and you need them, then they will go out, but then at night. Areas like in New York City is going to be very difficult because obviously... I mean, there's way too many people, but if you live in towns or villages where you're going to have wildlife, it certainly helps them that it's dark at night. So yes, I, I would support the idea of having most, uh, those uh, type of light fixtures. Great. Now, David wanted to know, uh, did you do any light painting on that first image and on the Temple of the Sun image, or was that just natural light? The Temple of the Sun had not light painting. Let me differentiate light painting from low-level light. 
Okay, low level light is what I use. I don't use light painting. Imagine me going with a with a uh, flashlight going like that. Light painting uses a flashlight and you move your light to illuminate. And that's actually is not easy to reproduce. So if you actually look at it, it's like, I don't like it, then you have to do it all over again. Low level light is basically, that's what I use the, I have them over there, so we should, anyway. I use like a mini panel and I can turn them on at 1%. So they're very, very dim. They're actually dimmer than full moon. So that's not disrupting for an animal because full moon is there and animals can live with full moon. So if it's so, so dim, it's not disruptive to the environment. And you can use those LED lights and they're gonna be spreading evenly. So it makes it easier to illuminate your foreground. As I said, some parks like Arches, because of delicate arch being so incredibly popular that the, the people in the park already started worrying about the impact of photographers in those areas at night. So Arches and even Capitol Reef now, they do not allow any light, low level light. Light painting, most parks do not accept light painting because you are with a very powerful flashlight and you're gonna go and paint that's gonna disrupt wildlife. But you don't have to. I mean, when sometimes I, I use low level light, I use it for maybe, if I expose for 15 minutes, I use it for five minutes, but the remaining 10 minutes, I'll turn it off and I let the stars illuminate because then I have not just the temple, I have the background behind the temple also get details. Because otherwise, if you just use the low level light, you're just gonna have the temple illuminated, but your background is still will really be dark because you having your LED light is not gonna go that far. So I do a combination of both, a little bit of low level light so that I have good details in whatever is closest to me, but I let the stars illuminate the rest so I get the entire background foreground. Great. Now we'll we'll end off with this question here from David. Uh, who says, it seems that getting a really good image is more related to your gear, considering camera and lens, other than just photography, which we can debate. But how <laughs> how true is this? Uh, like, for instance, he's got a mid-level full frame, not great at higher ISOs, and only currently has a lens that is greatest aperture is 4.5. Uh, his foregrounds do not pick up as much light as your shots would. Uh, is this due to an equipment limitation or the low level light you use? Well, uh, 4.5, you said 4.2. Uh, that's actually a very small aperture for night photography. So that's going to make it hard. Uh, if you want to try Astro, I would say go for the star trades. Because the star trails, you can shoot at f8 if you want to. I mean, it's going to be a challenge. You're going to have to shoot for a couple of minutes at f8. But certainly, star trails are more forgiven. You can use any aperture. The problem that you have is that such a small aperture is going to force you to use a longer shutter speed, which is going to have your stars trailing regardless. So it's not so much the sensor or the camera you have. It's more the lens. Uh, if you really enjoy night photography, you start with the starters, you really enjoy it, I would say v &H has a wonderful use department. Get a used uh, lens, get a prime lens, a 35 millimeter prime. Again, I'm an icon shooter, so I don't know other, but I'm sure they all have 35 millimeter primes and they can shoot a 1.8. You don't, and those are cheap. And if you got them used, they're also cheaper. So, and those are gonna give you much better results, a lot better, because you, then you can go to F2. And then, yes, you're at 35, but then you can also do panels. And 35 actually gives you a very nice close up of the Milky Way with the composition. So I actually like shooting at 35 a lot, so. Ima, I wanna thank you again for being here. You always do a wonderful job in bringing thank you. photos and information to us. So we really appreciate it. Uh, if you haven't already, Ima's information has been up here since she finished. So at least for about the last 15, 20 minutes. So go shoot her a follow, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram, or just check out her website, share her work. That's how we grow as creators and uh, grow the whole entire thing that we're doing here. So thank you again to everybody who tuned in and watched. We hope you enjoyed this and we thank you for joining us tonight. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I'll see you back here tomorrow. This has been another edition of the BH virtual event space. We'll catch you next time. Thank you so much, everybody. And feel free to reach out. Thank you.